Each Saturday at this same time, the National Broadcasting Company presents Morgan Beatty's War Telescope, a review of the war week and a forecast of possible developments to come. Morgan Beatty is NBC's veteran war reporter in the British capital. And so for his regular Saturday report, we take you now to London. This is Morgan Beatty looking at the 205th week of war through the war telescope. And this week we focus our attention on a report from a news agency you probably never heard of. It's the German International Information Bureau with headquarters in Berlin. Foreign correspondents in London and other news capitals of Europe have long been interested in this curious outfit. In the past, the International Bureau has released information of a semi-official nature. The Bureau almost never puts out official information for the Nazis. Rather, it seems to be used to prepare the public for shocking or decisive information so that when the official information is released, people are more or less prepared for it. Sort of like a doctor uh, hinting to the family that the patient is in extreme danger without actually saying that he thinks the patient's dying. In any event, a few hours ago, the German International Information Service slipped an insignificant dispatch into the stream of the news. A dispatch that quoted reports in Berlin to the effect that the Fuhrer and his military and political satellites had met in the Fuhrer's headquarters to discuss political and military matters of extreme importance. When that dispatch reached London, one important word commanded the attention of veteran newsmen who keep the pulse of events. It's the word political. And I confirm the fact that there's more than a mere news dispatch behind the report of a meeting of critical importance in the Fuhrer's headquarters. It can be verified from other sources. But let's check back to discover why the Fuhrer and his political satellites and the military figures of Germany have assembled to make important decisions. In the first place, German leadership has suffered a succession of shocks in the last month, probably as great as any national leadership has been called upon to take in any like period of time. Usually, the leaders of a nation can prepare people for shocks to come. For example, the Russian reversals at the start of the war on the Eastern Front were more or less gradual. That is, the public could be prepared over a period of a couple of weeks to, con to expect continuing bad news and a policy of military withdrawal. And that policy could be explained while the Russian armies at the same time were trying to master the new blitz tactics of the Germans. Later that same year in Washington, I remember the two weeks before the great Pearl Harbor disaster. I'd been told reliably that I could not make a mistake if I took an extremely pessimistic view. That American diplomacy saw no way out of the war with Japan unless Japan backed down. And they could not be expected to do that in the circumstances. Our leaders could not say this without officially closing the door to peace. But unofficially, it can be said as a matter of factual reporting by newsmen. So that even though the Japanese did surprise us by their deceptive attack. Nevertheless, basically, most Americans were already aware that a dangerous crisis had developed, and they were warned before the attack came. They had the background of events. They knew why what had happened had happened. And in neither of these cases did a national upheaval develop. Note the difference when France fell. The shock in France, of course, could not be sustained in any event. But Britain was totally unprepared for that shock, and the complete change of government in an orderly manner, of course, took place. The nation turned logically enough to the one great, great voice that had been raised in urgent warning, the voice of Winston Churchill. After that, the British settled down to battle it out. And battle it out they did with confidence in the power behind the voice of Winston Churchill. In the case of the Germans in August 1943, as we've noted, a series of great shocks has occurred within the last four weeks. German leadership was obviously caught by surprise. No effort had been made by the usual propaganda services of Germany to prepare the people for the shock of the latest Allied air attack in the West, particularly on Hamburg, the second largest city in Germany. Nothing had been said in advance of the fall of Mussolini to indicate that Italy was tottering on the brink of internal chaos as well as disaster from without. In the case of Orel, the collapse of the Orel pocket in the battle line of the East, the Nazis had actually led their people to believe that the line was impregnable, that Nazi leadership had deliberately decided to undertake the defensive for a while, and that defensive attitude and position was just as victorious, if not more so, than the German army on the offensive. And finally, the newest Russian drive, the battle of the Ukraine that seems to be opening up, is worse than a surprise for the Germans. It must be impressing the average German with a new sense of fear. It must be undermining German faith in the capacity of present political and strategic leaders to understand what's going on. 
The Nazi mistake in this case, of course, was to tell the people of Germany that all the nation had to do now was to stick it out until the United Nations fell apart. And then each enemy could be defeated in turn, all in good time. But things are not turning out that way. Every German, particularly every Berliner, has his eyes on the calendar by day and the sky by night. As the calendar approaches the time when daylight and dark are equal, the sky is expected to be filled with Allied planes. In the East, things are even worse. The Orel pocket collapsed, despite the most heroic resistance of German soldiers. As Elmer Peterson reported from London earlier today, the Red Army victories at Orel and Bielgorod may well have struck serious blows at the morale of the ordinary German soldier. The fighting on the Orel front was done, says Pete, on a narrow front. And each and every German soldier could hardly escape the certain knowledge that he fought with the full weight of German armor behind him. He couldn't be told, as soldiers often are, that he might be losing in this little spot, but his comrades were winning somewhere else. The German soldier knew full well on the Orel front that his master planners had gone amiss long ago. So we can understand that the veteran newsman of London sat up and took notice today when they got a dispatch from the German International Information Bureau saying that the German high command was meeting to make decisions. What puzzled these newsmen was not the fact that a meeting was held. Obviously, a meeting had to be held. It was absolutely necessary. A meeting of military minds. But why political discussion at this time in Germany? The fall of Mussolini is the focal point of all this because that alone robs the Germans themselves of the last vestige of faith in one-man government. Every German family that's lost a son on any front, and there are millions of them, must trace that loss to one man. And what has Germany to show for it? Nothing but territory the nation has not got the time to develop. The enemy without grows stronger every day, and another winter's ahead. But that's only part of the story. What's the effect of German reverses on the satellite powers of Europe? John McVeigh, who does as fine a job of reporting on the economic front as he does on the war fronts, has just turned up some authentic information. And he sent it along to NBC in America for you, but it fits in the general picture right here, so we'll repeat it. John has discovered evidence is accumulating in London that Hungary, Romania, and other German satellites are worried about the future. And especially so, since they've got huge piles of financial credit in Berlin and no machinery or goods to show for that credit. Germany's been taking raw materials and food from these countries for three years and giving them bank balances instead of machinery and materials. Now these countries are trying to cash in, to get something so they won't be left holding a bag full of German promises on the day of the Allied victory. John says the economic experts here in London are watching these signs of cracks in the German economic structure in Europe, hopefully. They, the experts, believe that Germany now lacks war reserves at last that she's living from hand to mouth and is already unable to plan for next year. Now, when you add uh, this bit of information to the fact that Sweden is forbidding the Germans to transport their troops and supplies on Swedish railways and throw in the growing independence of the other neutral nations, and you read dispatches from Spain indicating that great events are transpiring in Germany, events that cannot now be reported by Spanish reporters, you have at least got one total fact that Hitler is, in both political and military hot water and plenty of it, and something must be done about it. But what? That's the question. The most important single bit of proof about the way the wind blows is the fact that the Orel withdrawal of the Germans was an obviously military decision without any of the flavor of the Fuhrer's intuition about it. That would indicate clearly that military leaders are certainly making the decisions on the war fronts these days without Hitler's personal help. And this fact leads many careful observers here to suggest that the German people would like to feel they had more of this steady military leadership at the helm. If this is the case, and it sounds reasonable, the remark of one veteran correspondent to me seems to make sense, namely, that the Germans are getting ready anyway to do something about Hitler, certainly something about the Nazis. But how it can be done, and should the military go all the way as Badoglio did in Italy, those are questions. And is Hitler going back to the home front to leave military affairs to military men? There are no answers to these questions, but the nervous breakdown so often reported from Germany, well, it might be reported again soon. It may be no more accurate than the old reports, this nervous breakdown of Hitler, 
but it may indicate that a new helmsman is in charge. Here in Britain, as we reported to you last night, there is increasing optimism. The restraints of war, four years of war, are weighing heavily on the shoulders of everybody. And the government's taking steps that indicate to the people that this is no time to lift the burden. Rather, it should be increased for the final push. There's the threat to call up women between 45 and 50. The Churchill cabinet suggested such a call up may be necessary at a most interesting moment, just before the summer recess of Parliament. Immediately, a wave of protest swept the country. Women began writing to the editor. They do that over here more than you folks do at home. One, mom, one woman said she had given a husband to Britain in the first war, and she was raising her children during very difficult times in this war. She didn't so, see why she should desert them in their adolescence, that they were more important than the few bolts and nuts she could turn out in a war factory. In the end, the government agreed not to call up the older women, at least until Parliament returns and has a chance to debate the issue. But the point is, the Churchill cabinet has tossed the most interesting issue into the arena of public opinion and at a most interesting moment. The pros and cons will be debated at length. During the recess, the debate in the pubs and the press and on the air will bring out one point clearly, however, that the manpower problem is still with the nation, even though the news from the battlefront is better. Four years of war do not in themselves, you know, create enthusiasm in any country. Yesterday, I dropped into a big department store tea room for a cup of coffee, incidentally, and a roll. Half the tables were roped off and vacant, although there was a tea time crush in the dining room. There aren't enough waitresses to handle the demand. Seated with me was a young man and his wife. Neither was in the services, but both had been frozen for the duration to civilian jobs in war industries. He was a draftsman, and she was the confidential secretary in an important factory. These young folks chatted not about the details of their work, but about how hard it is to keep your spirits up when you're frozen to your job, and your wages are also frozen. Together, these beginners in adult life were making about 10 pounds a week. That's about $40 or a little less. Good wages in peacetime, but if they could go into a factory and get a skilled position in a trade, they could double those wages and put something more aside for the homes they want. But the government wants people like these to understand why their sacrifice is not only necessary, but at this time, in this optimistic hour, why it is even more necessary than in the past. That's the government's point of view. But even more significant in the face of optimistic war news is the reaction in responsible quarters outside the government in Britain. Thinking people on all sides are reminding themselves that the good news from the war fronts imposes even heavier responsibilities on the government here and in all the United Nations. Today, the Financial News and The Economist, two conservative old papers in London, stood up and fairly shouted that the British government had better prepare itself against political and financial mistakes in the midst of military successes. The news says the decision of the American and British governments to not allow the people, that is, not to allow people to buy up properties cheap in Sicily, is a good decision. It means, says the news, in effect, that we won't plunder the conquered nations the way the Germans have. The Economist reminds Mr. Churchill in state language that democracy is as democracy does. And he'd better prepare to prove to the world that our kind of government and our people can handle the great problem of peace. As efficiently, by the way, as we're now handling war. Thus, government educates the people, and the people educate government in democracy. All of which is a good sign for the future, unless the collapse of the Axis in Europe should come more rapidly than anybody thinks. Which, incidentally, would be all right, too, wouldn't it? And now, this is Morgan Beatty saying so long until next Saturday. You have been listening to War Telescope, a weekly report on the war as seen from London by Morgan Beatty, NBC's veteran war observer in the British capital. Mr. Beatty is presented every Saturday at this same time, so be sure to tune in again a week from now. This is the National Broadcasting Company.